This is Aliens and Artists, part one of our conversation with Sebastian Siegel. I'm your host, Stuart Davis. Sebastian is a British-American director, author, and integral artist, working in fields of psychology, performance, and filmmaking. He lives in a high-rise building in Hollywood, one of the most densely packed urban locales in the world, which makes the UFO he photographed just outside his window doubly interesting. The craft in those pictures was also photographed over a metropolitan area in China, halfway around the world. I spoke with him from his home, where the sighting took place. Contextually, to start with, the photographs that and you've been in my home in Century City, in Los Angeles, and you know I overlooked the whole city. And so from time to time, I'll just take photos of whatever's going on out there. So during the fires nine years ago, or whatever it was, 10 years ago, uh, I could see the fires coming over the hill, and it looked like the edge of California was on fire. So I shot those photographs, and I'm just taking them with my iPhone. I'm not a photographer by any means. Just sometimes there'll be a spectacular moon, which never looks that great from the from the phone, mm-hmm. uh, or a beautiful sunrise, or a color in the sky and a sunset. And so once in a while, I'll see something that I'm not sure what it is, and I'll just photograph it because it's beautiful. And When I took those photos, the first time I saw that craft was 10 years ago, and it was around the same time that uh, the almost very similar looking craft was photographed in China. And my experience was such that I looked out the window, I saw this thing, and I looked and I thought, what is that? Because I've seen so many helicopters and planes and, uh, and blimps and other things. But I said, I don't, what is that? You know, and I wasn't like, oh my God, what the hell? What's going on with that? I was just like, what is that? Like, I'm so curious. Like looking at a flower that has some weird petal. You know, I was really like, <laughs> what is that? That's excellent. And then was there for a few seconds and was able to photograph it. And then put those photos up 10 years ago, nine years ago, whatever, when, when that was, and didn't think anything of it. And this was before Instagram. And this is, you know, shortly after the iPhone came around. And so I think we were using Twitter or MobyPick or something like that, right? And it just didn't have that much traction. But people really responded to it, like, what is that? And weren't sure. So then when I shared those photos and saw the similar craft a, a few weeks ago, of everything I've ever put up, online and I don't do a lot of social media you know most of it is sort of just art film you know mm-hmm. kind of gentle passive stuff I'm not selling anything I'm not trying to drive anything but I was like wow I, I wanted to put those up there the the responses were through the roof so for anyone who's listening to this on my Instagram page there's these chronological four or five photos of this UFO outside of my home and uh, a couple of friends a friend of mine re shared them and matched them next to the photos of the craft in China, which I was not familiar with. <laughs> you know, oh. When I looked at the photos next to each other, it's very, very similar. Yes. Uncanny similar. And what was interesting is the responses were so that people responding at, on ways that are archaic, Magic, mythical, rational, transrational. <laughs> you know? so some people would say, like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, you know, what I wrote is, there's no statement here. This is just what I saw. What are you trying to say? What, what are you saying to us? You know, what are you trying to say? To- I'm not trying to say anything. I'm just saying this is what I saw. This is my experience, right? This is a visual reproduction of what I've been able to capture with this technology. And then other people were like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> you know, that's I've seen something similar. I and mean, the number of responses, both defensive and seductive and the excitability and the fear and the awe. And then the, the, what's interesting is the impulse for some people to really want to just deny, deny, deny. And then other people to really want to say, yes, I'm open. And, and really, in other words, how it's a statement of where people are in terms of how they respond with the, the type of response that elicits. So I think for me, the first time uh, 10 years ago when I saw this craft uh, in front of my home, you know, I I didn't think much of it. I mean, I just saw it and I photographed it and I just was like, 
but I suppose in the same way, in one of the ways that you and I are simpatico, is there's a flexibility and an openness and a willingness for anything to be spectacular and a miracle. And I think that it's part of that contemplative Zen practice. And I think about even like the original Zen meditation when the Buddha is talking to his disciples and holds the flower, you know, and then the one disciple comes up and takes the flower. This, this is ultimately, you know, what later becomes the Zen practice. A hundred years later, a formal Zen practice is that there is no words, there is no prayer, there is no thing. It is only in experiential, comprehensible in some way through just deep intuitive experience. I pulled in one day and the moon was full and it was around the time that the Neowise comet was in the air and it was really, really bright and it was like below the moon, it was the brightest thing in the sky. And I pulled in and, and the valet was downstairs, this guy, really, really gentle, uh, gentleman. And I looked up in the moon and I was just like caught in rapture and awe. And I was like, <laughs> and I turned to him and I said, that's real. Like, that's real. And he looked at me and says, yeah, 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 it's the moon. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, I said no but, but that's that's real and he says yeah, yeah it's real it's the moon it's right there <laughs> what i'm i think meandering into here is that there's this um trickery that we are able to drop into which we're seeing now on a global level in a lot of ways with this shutdown and the reorientation of things to reduce things right to exteriors and say, well, the moon's 200,000 miles away and it's made of dust and stone and et cetera. And then, and then, you know, we reduce it to that. And it's the same thing like when we, 20 years ago, you open up a fitness magazine and it says, well, blueberries are good for you. So everyone's like, well, all right, we're going to start eating blueberries now. You know, and I think what your conversation is and what these sightings are, what people's experiences are, and however it's able to seep into someone's consciousness to open them up. Maybe it's my photograph. Maybe it's your discussions. Maybe it's seeing something in China. Maybe it's their own experience. Maybe it's the Pentagon actually saying, there are things flying around out there. We don't know what they are. Maybe it's that footage that they released that says, hey, the footage that came out years ago, we are saying, we're giving a formal statement. We don't know what these pilots saw. Whatever it is, it's an invite into the mystery and the miracle that is this gorgeous, spectacular labyrinth. And I think that's what fascinates me the most. And, you know, when I was thinking about our conversation the other night before I went to bed, I was sort of breathing it in and I looked deep into the mirror into my eyeball and I was looking at the, the pupil, you know, dilate, close. And then I was looking at the threads woven into the colors in my eye mm. and the brown and the deep green. And I was like, oh, 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 oh. that's as alien an experience is anything. <laughs> yeah. So the challenge is if we have this mind and this way of this convention and we're trying to speak in conventional and rational terms, but by nature it's paradoxical in the way that we have to reach beyond ourselves and open up our mind in a way that is largely ineffable. We can only draw any kind of inference or any kind of statement about it through some sort of define any kind of meaning and the moment we start to reduce it, we kind of miss the mark. So how do you apprehend this mysterious content, you know, mysterious emergence in a way to make sense of it as if there's a, in other words, I suppose, in short, it's hard for me to find any kind of direction. I hate to put a directionality to it because it sounds like I'm trying to summarize with a, with a theory like Stephen Hawking. So what do you do with it outside of the experience? It's such an interesting point of inquiry. To begin with, I would like to affirm your rendering of these types of events as a Rorschach blot for worldviews. The comment thread in your photo posting is a perfect example of that. It's truly a survey through these altitudes, states, and worldviews. States because you can see how certain people get triggered, put into an emotional bundle. The responses are almost hilarious in what an easy plumbing they are of world views. It also reminds me quite vividly of a tangent, but still closely related to all of this. Dean Radin. 
who you may know has done exhaustive work on the empirical evidence for psi phenomena. I was having this conversation with Ken Wilber, just saying, the data is bonkers. Dean Radin's collected works show, without a doubt, there's more evidence for this than there is for many of the fundamental features of what we know as the laws of physics. And Ken said, yeah, we don't have an evidence problem. We have a worldview problem. The struggles and hurdles have nothing to do with data. The data is there. It is real. The worldviews are the obstacles we are going to have to traverse in order to get more meaningful relationship with this set of phenomena. This is a long way around to answer your question. It's helped me a lot reflecting on that as I get older. The deeper, more long-term relationship I'm in with the phenomena, non-human entities, contact, craft, I realize we're not having a conversation about whether or not these events and entities have an ontological status. They do have a legitimate ontological status. The question is, what is the nature of it? What is our relationship to it? A fascinating aspect of beginning that inquiry is something Sean as Bjorn Hargens refers to as doubleness. These entities and this set of phenomena exhibit and seem to thrive on doubleness. You can't get subject, object, binary with this. The moment we succumb to the seduction of planting this squarely in a particular quadrant, saying, this is objective, this is nuts and bolts. As soon as you do that, it's going to show up with high strangeness. It's going to transgress the categories and partitions we find so satisfying in that nuts and bolts category. As soon as you say, inversely, that it's purely subjective, it's a tulpa-like event created from a mutual projection of the witnessing parties. As soon as you do that, it will leave scorch marks. A craft will be recovered. Some truly objective item will punch through the membrane of that quadrant. What do you do with that? Well, you don't do much with it unless you make friends with doubleness. We can't do much with these phenomena and entities unless we have what you related, this not knowing, which is evoked in so many of our traditions, whether it's Zen or the cloud of unknowing from Christianity. There's a lot to be derived from esoteric and mystical traditions. If you're a practitioner in these lineages, then we start to find usefulness. But none of it comes in the form of us having command or penetrating apprehension. This remains so enigmatic that for me personally, the only gratifying relationship that I've been able to get a modicum of is remaining in that unknowing to some degree. Are there any other experiences you've had in your life? Sometimes one experience will trigger a memory of another. Initially, they may seem disparate, unrelated, but on more sustained scrutiny, I detect possible tethers between them, like there's something afoot. So what else has figured in this prismatic question of your life? Oh, God, that's gorgeous. You know, I the step off there is that because seeing is so wonderful, right, and hearing and smelling, because our senses are so spectacular, it's easy for us to truncate things down into those interpretations. And just in the same way that we look out at the, we get used to not seeing space, obviously, right? We see things, we see objects, we see emergence, we don't see space. And yet we look out into the stars, into the night sky, and we can only see all those stars and the moon and any objects because of the space. And so the space is really all that really exists, right? Mm -hmm. it's the space is what's really going on. And so how do we start seeing the space? And how do we see it through all of our senses? And I appreciate that step into that because uh, I think about synchronicity being one of the ways to see and experience that space. Yes, right? yes time and I think you know one of the one of the wonderful synchronistic experiences I had was with you yes for people who are tuning into this uh, Stuart and I made a short film called just be yourself which Stuart wrote and directed and I produced and we were both in, in an ensemble with two other glorious actresses Candace and Allison essentially there's this lineage of this character transcending and becoming from the little self to the next self to the next self and, so in short, 
we thought, well, it would be really cool if this character had some sort of marking to represent that lineage. So I said, well, what about like a Moibos strip, like an eternal thing, like a tattoo on one hand? And we were just on set coming up with this just randomly. So you were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you said, or, or a, a barcode, right? Like yeah. <laughs> a barcode yeah. from the store yeah. like when you buy a, a thing of pancakes or whatever. <laughs> There's a hundred million of them out there. So you got the barcode on there. I said, yes, yeah. so we'll put a Moibus tattoo on one hand and the barcode on the other hand. And so we're like, all right, that's great. So in the beginning, I have that. And then the character that Stu plays, then later at the end of the film, then he has that. And then the idea was then there was going to be one final character who was going to come in and he was then going to be the next in the lineage. And then we would give him those things, right? Fine. So we come up with that on set in the middle of our four day shoot or whatever. Right. And so at that juncture, we cast this kid who's going to not to, you know, go on a tangent. This kid's going to put together a puzzle and then he's going to later come in and, and be the final person in, the, in this lineage, right? The next step, whatever, in this lineage. And so when he's going to put together the puzzle, he takes off his shirt and this kid's got a tattoo, right? And the tattoo is of a Moivis strip on his chest. And Stuart and I are sitting watching this kid take off his shirt and we're like, whoa, he's got a Moivis strip. And then he turns around and he's got a barcode. Oh my oh God. God. It's impossible. It's utterly impossible. That's exactly what happened. I'll tell you, Sebastian, that I have shared that story and people think I'm full of shit. They don't believe me. Luckily, we had all these witnesses. It's exactly as you related. We spontaneously came up with those tattoos on set. Then this guy shows up for his shoot with a barcode and a Mobius strip tattoo. Now, one of those we could consider possibly to be a coincidence, but both of them, I simply cannot conceive of an explanation sufficient. You and I went crazy. We scared the shit out of him. He thought, he thought we were fucking with him. He couldn't grok it either. He couldn't accept it. We eventually all got there, but it stopped production. <laughs> it was like being hit by lightning. You're right. These kinds of synchronicities are in the back pocket of the phenomena we're discussing. To what degree have you cultivated these kinds of experiences? And if you have, has it ever spooked you, the manner in which it has presented itself? Wow. It's a great question. First of all, I have great appreciation for what you were saying earlier about the challenge isn't the proof, the challenge isn't the science. The challenge isn't the things that we're measuring or seeing, that we're aware of experientially, of unknown phenomenon, UFOs, etc. The challenge is the microscope, the telescope, or the way by which we're processing, just like it always has been, just like it was with Copernicus. There's all this stuff going on that is ridiculous until it's obvious, and then when it's obvious, it's mundane. You know, the job here, right, in the combo is really just step in there somewhere and say, wait a second. It's not obvious, it's not ridiculous, it's not mundane. Like, it's spectacular, it's beautiful. And it's happening, and it's gonna keep happening, and it's never gonna stop happening. And not only that, it's the only thing that is happening, right? Yeah, yeah. We are that, you know, we're this aspect of that, you know? So how, we don't wanna to rush to the end of the song, but we wanna say, well, like, let's not be afraid, and let's allow ourselves to openly, like, really take this deep consciousness breath, you know, really accept this, the, the miracle, the spectacular thing that's going on. Let's explode onto the scene of ourselves. I was thinking that you know, also what you're saying about how these this sort of relationship of this conversation that occurs over time or beyond time in terms of re responding to it in different ways or, or engaging it in, in different ways. I was about five or six or something and I was in the elevator with my father visiting my father in Hawaii and you know my father's a professor of comparative religions and his specialty is India and so the the Hindu comics had a big impact on me growing up and that's relevant I think because the sense of having all these avatars all these Hindu gods are avatars of one another that they all are interlinked and this yeah. sort of never, it always it just goes on in these different forms that different faces emerge and they all seem to be related and have similar characteristics and yet totally very different and represent very different things but through similar colors and, and, and bodies and, and, and such 
And that spoke to me in a way, in a deep way, somehow. It seemed appropriate to what was going on in the world, that you travel somewhere and you, you run into someone and they look exactly like someone that you've known before. And you think this is beyond the biology, so much so that you have to go up to the person and say, do you know Joe from Texas or whatever, right. you know, and you're in the middle of Paris or something like right. this? And they say, no, no, I don't. Are you, are you sure? Because it's uncanny. It's insane, right? So I was with my father in the elevator, and I, and I said to him, I said, you know, if I was having communication with other forms of life, would you believe me? And he said, of course I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, One yeah, for the team. Yeah, yeah, for the team. And I think that he's just such a, you know, creative, open mind, you know, and flexible in that way. And that's the greatest gift that we can give, not just to our children, but to one another as adults. And somehow we give that to children, but we don't give that to ourselves. Like, what the fuck? Why do we stop doing that, right? Oh. And I think about the challenge and why it's intimidating for us even in synchronicity, and we discussed it that day that this happened on set with this, this gentleman, this actor, that the misinterpretation, obviously, of synchronicity is that people feel like it's happening because of them, mm -hmm. right? That they see something, they say, oh, well, this is God or the universe telling me this thing. And then I think about it as, well, the appropriate interpretation of synchronicity is it's like one petal coming out of a flower. As the flower is opening, the petal looks across and sees another petal and is like, oh, my God, yeah. there's a current of which I am an aspect of, mm -hmm. and my eyes are just wide enough, are open wide enough, that I'm able to see this occurrence and have from this vantage point, the sense of a greater vantage point, yeah. that there's this flower exploding, that there are all these flowers exploding, right? So in other words, synchronicity is really how open are our eyes? Because yes. the more open our eyes are, the more synchronistic experiences we're going to have, the more we're going to be in awe all the time. But, it's going on. So true. It's a way to plumb the consciousness which we are an aspect of. You're right to bring up the temptation we feel in a super strong synchronicity to commodify it, to commandeer it, and attempt to use it as an advocacy for whatever our pet project is. Mad props to your dad. I love that you brought up this aspect that we will do this for children for our loved ones, but not for ourselves. The mystery that's inside many of these high strange experiences, these transfiguring encounters, let's follow that thread. Something I'm passionate about these days is experiencers, what they go through in life. Unlike you and I who are artists and creators, we're, we are supposed to be unconventional and draw outside the lines, we get special license and latitude. But almost all the experiencers that I talk to, they don't want to be public. They don't want to be on a show. They just want someone to hear what happened to them. Because it has completely changed their life. They're worried they're going to lose their job, be ostracized. They're worried they're going to lose relationships, status. And essentially they want catharsis and integration. So... How do we cultivate cultural conditions in which this stigma can be dissolved and brought to an end? Yeah, I think you're doing it with this conversation. And, I, and like you're saying, Joe Rogan covering it and even the you know, Pentagon coming out with stuff saying, hey, we, we don't know what these objects are. We don't know what these things are flying around. People sharing that with one another. And that's the cool thing, the hopeful thing. And of course, the dangerous thing is there's another roadblock down the road somewhere where it gets even weirder out of conventional terms or yeah. out of transrational or, or you know, post-conventional terms, more spectacular. More bizarre. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be another denial, another, whoa, I'm not ready for this yet, right? You know, that's where the conversation, I think, it gets really thick and interesting. It dovetails back into how we sort of started this about looking at the space and the space is really where the action's at. You know, people understand that, we understand that poetically, but then, you know, we read an article in science and it says, well, all right, X amount of the universe is black matter and we can't really see that. We can only, in fact, when we photograph it, we can only photograph it because of the way the light bends between solar systems or, you know, a nebula out there. And then we know, we know that what we're looking at is really there because we can't see it, but it's bending everything else, right? Yeah. And that people say, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, but yet there's still a reluctance to say, well, some of that's happening in my living room. Some of that's happening in my head, 
some yeah. of that's happening in my world. Some of some of that's happening in the communication yeah. between us, you know, between one another. And that's what really gets spectacular. The need for humans to reduce things and have a handle on things. Yeah. And I think that the beautiful part about that need is that that's why there are so many books and poems and songs and movies made about love because yeah. we need to express it. And yet it is obviously ineffable. And it's this current of which we're born out of and we have to keep discussing it because we can't quite get a handle on it. And so yeah. I think it's the same thing with this, that it's always been happening, right? As you said, you know, it's always occurring. It's always, but it's just that now we're ready to start weaving it into part of our notion of existence. You know, you asked uh, earlier and I didn't quite, uh, and I wanted to ground it in some sort of specific experience about being spooked and not just having a total awe and elation, you know, whether it's in the form of, and I think people think about UFOs and think about, well, that's interesting because it's a specific visual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And then there are the other things that are experiential phenomenon like synchronicity, which is another form of dynamic communication within the cosmos, right, woven into the universe. And when an individual is really open to dropping into those wavelengths and feeling out those undercurrents that are always percolating, that then something else starts to open up in the world. To ground that in a simple experience, you know, someone could be walking down the street and they catch eye contact with a young child. And they catch eye contact and they see and the young child like looks and then looks back. And then there's this I thou godly experience, which is this total mystical miracle right there's this total communication without words there's the connection and then maybe the other parent will look and say well my child's having this experience with this other adult like and that's it and it's an instant and gone and i was asleep the other night uh, maybe within the last couple of weeks and right before i woke up i dreamt that i was being sucked out into the ocean and the, and the water was very dark like a dark pearl black water and it was nighttime out and I was on the shoreline and I was being sucked under and I looked up and this wave came and I took a breath and then I went under and I was at the bottom of the ocean right on the sand. It was like the wave enfolded me in there and right as it enfolded me in there, there was a little space of oxygen and I thought, and I could feel this, like this, I could feel it. And there was an earthquake occurring at that time. And I woke up and, you know, my home was gently swaying. And it was the same thing that my response is to say, I don't want to be too objective because I don't, because if I get objective, I'm going to go, wow, this is great. You know, <laughs> like, fuck yeah. You know? You know? But then I'm going to be like just a witnesser of, the thing, you know, but I want to partake in, I want to be part, I want to be woven into the fabric of the experience. So instead of reacting, I'll hold that, defer it, and just, what is this occurrence? Which aspect of it, what parts of me are, are exist within this sound, in this feel, in this strong phenomenon? And it haunted me for a bit in a way that I suppose the end effect if there is one is it reopens my eyes yeah and then i'm grateful for that and so i think that the same thing like with seeing the ufo out there and then seeing it again and then and then sharing those older photos of it people's response to it the gift it is for me in this world in my little self is that it reopens my eyes because i am also guilty of closing my eyes mm -hmm. i'm also guilty of from time to time thinking that things are regular and normal and i'm and i get disgusted and ashamed of myself when i think that but when i have that spark of courage within me where something elicits a response it can even be somebody says something and it really disturbs us and we don't react or respond because we're kind and gender but then we think god you know i really need to write something about that or i really need to call or send this message there isn't a rough intent here but the intent here is for mutual awakening and sometimes that mutual awakening has a lot of salt baked into the cake. Mm. I'm willing to, to hurt for it or be crucified for it or whatever. I have such great love and respect and faith for this relationship, me with you, 
me with the universe or, or me as an aspect of the universe that I know it's not going to disintegrate or fall apart. And so I'm comfortable vocalizing, you know, I'm comfortable sharing. So I think that that spark that gets us to engage with the world uh, has to be something. And you expressed this very beautifully in my first documentary film that you're in. Shameless plug if you haven't seen it. <laughs> oh, we'll definitely be, yeah, plug it. And we're also putting it in the show notes. Yeah. All that stuff will be in there. But, you know, Stuart's in this, uh, uh, you're in this, um, you know, my first documentary is very simple, you know, documentary, very pop accessible film, but about what, you know, what is love and what is the purpose of life and what's heaven, hell, intimacy. And you talk about love, you know, masquerading around in these other forms to draw us ultimately into our greater uh, evolution. In other words, that love will hook us with a lure, pull us in, like in the way that you express it in the film, is you say, like, you know, all the greatest things in life scare you at first. It's like, well, getting married. Like, I don't want to do that, but ultimately it breaks you open. Mm. I don't want kids. Holy Jesus, God, no. And then it just breaks <laughs> you open. And, uh, love masquerades around to bring us into our own becoming, that there has to be a lure. And so sometimes the lure, if we're available to it, is subtle and we allow it in. And then for other people, it has to be like the Pentagon says something, or it has to be a war, a grave, intense disease or illness, you know, or it has to be something really devastating. And I think that's, to put a bow on that, that's people's intuitive drive at some juncture to say, I'm gonna take up a meditative practice. Mm. I'm going to dry fast for seven days no water, no food, nothing. Mm. Or I'm going to fast, just water for seven days or 20 days. Or I'm going to just juice fast or whatever the thing is. In other words, or oh, I'm going to take LSD or I'm going to take ayahuasca. Or I'm going to, and the number of people now who will call me and say, have you done ayahuasca? Should I do it? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's like, what's that impulse? The impulse is to say there's something greater going on, which I'm an aspect and I want to open my eyes to mm. it, right? Uh, the opening of the eyes to it is just saying, well, I'm going to choose this content and I'm going to allow it in and I'm going to hold on really, really loosely, you know, without trying to map it out, without trying to iron it too, too specifically. What's your first experience conventionally? It's a slippery slope. What's your first experience from a conventional perspective of a, an otherworldly UFO, other type of intelligence interaction. I would place it squarely with an event that I think is something a lot of experiencers have. Up until now, this appears to be a feature of many experiencers' lives, and sadly, it's trauma. For some reason, there's a coupling between non-ordinary experience, the attendant sensitivities which are teased open. Very often, experiencers have traumatic childhoods. I did not. But I had an event which I typically don't speak about, but I will now. When I was in fifth grade, a real Lord of the Flies kind of thing went on in my school. Randomly select one person to absolutely ostracize. You're out of the village, go off to die. And I was selected. This went on for a long time, and I genuinely began to feel suicidal. I didn't have a single friend except my mom, who was a teacher in the school, so there's a double dose, extra punch. My mom got to observe all of this firsthand, and whatever I went through, I'm sure my mom felt orders of magnitude worse. Lots of suffering visited on her as well. In retrospect, I'm clear it was not personal. Herds of young children just have this within them. So I was cruelly abused and tormented. It was not physical, all psychological and emotional, but I began to feel suicidal. And in the nadir of the most dark moments, where I was truly desirous of a way out of this life, I was visited by a presence. This presence was amazing and loving. Just by the nature of its arrival, the ecosystem changed for me. This presence conveyed to me the first teaching of my life, you could say. It didn't use words, but communicated very clearly, there's a part of you that's already dead, and it's redundant to wish to die. There is a part of you that never dies, that's never been born, and you can't kill it. You can't get out of existence. The dead you already exists. And it did this in a way which was loving, 
but also disrupted my perception and interpretation of what had been happening to me. It was like it turned my face to show this is the real you. The real you is ageless, mysterious, this presence. You can never go away from it. It can never go away from you. It alleviated all of my depression. And the next day I went to school and I genuinely didn't care that I was ostracized anymore. I felt like I knew this secret. I had been shown this secret people don't know about. And then this real kicker, <laughs> it's like as soon as the children noticed I was no longer hurt, they ended the ostracization and took me back into their fold. I became the most popular kid in school, although I didn't care about that either. And I genuinely inhabited this new perspective. And that was the first experience of my life in which something not human made contact. And it possibly saved my life. How about you? Wow. <sighs> Boy, that stream of thought there and the experience is, um, you know, like what we're saying about something elicits a response and also love masquerading around in order to offer gifts. Because I think about the power and, you know, you're a highly acclaimed writer of lyrics. And, you know, when I started to really fall in love with your music, you know, some of the lyrics are just come from a place of that exact intersection between self and transcendence, between this life and the other. You speak and write and sing from a place of knowing that is totally tender and attached to the world and yet completely aware of the transience of this and the finality of it in all your, in so, you know, so many songs, right? You know, in Nicola, the acoustic version, if you haven't heard it on uh, YouTube, just look up Nicola Stuart Davis acoustic. It's one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life. It's one of the most eloquently written, and you know when <laughs> when you're singing it, that song it just it, it just it rocks me every time I hear it. It's so beautiful, and you talk really about in that song all these twins with different faces is the term. You know, just the spirit and this godliness that lives within all of us that is carried on through the human experience, through the manifestation of people. And how love erases and creates and erases and creates and erases and creates. And that when we can drop into that, you are also subtly saying with the grace and beauty of your voice, it hurts, you're saying in the language, but then it's juxtaposed with the beauty in your voice where you're saying it's going to be okay. It's gorgeous. This pain is gorgeous. And that can only be written from and sung from a place that is aware of that and so this brutal gift that you were drugged through as a kid ultimately informs so much of your art and your music i apprehended in a way with great appreciation and awe because i have the same sensibility as a storyteller that i was so interested in death and suicide as a kid it was a cutter to some degree and i was just and then i realized well no wait a second it's not death that i want it's transcendence. It's death of this ego. It's death of the attachment to this world. Ah, but like just like in all these Hindu comics and just like in this music or this movie or this story or whatever the thing is, there's a voice out there coming through so many other entities and individuals that's allowing me to know and to understand subtly, retrospectively, that I can transcend. I can be resurrected now and stay for another moment still in this life without suicide. And then, you know, later then, I think then that was then the awe of, you know, and the appreciation for these great epics, like the Bhagavad Gita, where if we could distill it down into a simple message, it would be like, all right, take action. If you're not sure, just do something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyone who hasn't read the Bhagavad Gita, that's what it's about. <laughs> you know? So, you know, that, that it's helpful in those ways. My first... <laughs> We're both acquaintances or friends with Stan Groff and are informed by his writing, so much of what he's talking about in hospice and then relating that back to the birth canal and postpartum and then in the womb. It's something that I've always been curious about. I was having a discussion 
recently with Alex and Allison Gray in their podcast, right? About the first, I think Allison asked, what was, how did my meditative practice start? And I thought, well, there's like, depends who you're asking, right? Because there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Like it can be conventional, like, well, whenever I was in seven, eight, nine, ten, looking at the candle or floating in the ocean and trying to feel where does the ocean begin and my mm. skin you know, start. And if I can really picture it while I'm floating there, there is no barrier. I'm trying to dissolve that barrier. And how can I feel out into the ocean and feel that same salt in my own cells as it actually penetrates my mm. own cells? And then later, this is a teen, basic, essential meditative practice. And then later, contemplative practice, and then conventional zazen, and then witness arising, and then being rocked by Ken Wilber's work, and then that rocking my game, Tonglen, and then and so many other practices that I was able to dexterously use for my own trickery and, and, and unfolding. Yeah. Um, but then, really, the, the response is when does the meditative practice start? Is ultimately this same question, right? What's the first? experience of otherworldly intelligence or presence yeah in other words that i that the meditation actually happened before we even came into this life it's always been going on it's always percolating and then just somehow after enough time or enough doing or enough or whatever the moment is of awakening that we we then are aware that ah we're having a conscious experience and we're identifying this conscious experience through this egoic interpretation of this singular entity, but actually it's always this great thing and it's always, you know, percolating. It's always running below the surface. And the more obviously we meditate, the more we're able to drop into that experience, right? The mm -hmm. more we're able to be awake. So I think about that first experience for me of uh, outside of convention, but then retrospectively understanding it through a convention would be in the womb and it would be just like an entity with a lamp. And there's a lamp and there's this sense of self, and it's from the third person of just a being that is visual in a dark, spheric existence, and there's some sort of lamp or light, and that's it. It's, it's bathed and immersed in heavy, thick, rich darkness, kind of like the wave in my dream, and there's just a gap and a space in there of sort of potential. And that's the best way I can describe it. The only other way would be through film or music or painting. But that experience is powerful for me. My mother told me that the first word I said was light. You know, I'm from England. I'm from Oxford. When I was born, a lot of, a lot of times uh, parents wouldn't say, you know, come to mama or papa. So your daddy or whatever. You know, most kids, especially in America, the first word is mom or dad because that's the word they hear the most, right? So my mother would say, come to Jackie. So it was always my mother's first name. And so I've never actually said an interpersonal pronoun to anyone I'm related to. <laughs> it's true. I, I say bro or brother or whatever, but I've never said like mom, dad. I've never called my mother mom. In other words, I've never said hi, mom, like ever, my whole life. Wow. I was told her by her first name, Jackie. And my father, I was called Lee. Now I, when I talk to him, I do it in a, sort of by saying my father. Uh, I always <laughs> call him by the first name, so my grandparents, everybody, right? And so she said the first word I said was light. And I thought, you know, and years later, like, did that relate back to this some sort of subtle or precognitive awareness that then was like seeped into being of the first conventional sense that I could have of what was really going on? which is ultimately this interplay between light and dark. And I think that like the discussion of synchronicity occurs beyond time or shows up again in our lives again, 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 and these different archetypes or avatars or signifiers. I had the first dream I remember, obviously in the Freudian interpretation of it, his sense of that the first dream carries a strong message about some sort of play out in life was similar in that way, it just was extrapolated with more details, this experience that I had in the womb of the light and the dark. And the first dream, I was like, I don't know, five or six or something like that, maybe. It was of a, this archetypal sort of animal, like a horse that was white, and a dark bull that was also very archetypal and grayish and silver and with this sort of pearly black beauty. It's in a forest, and I'm on one of them, and I'm part of one of them, but I don't know which one. And they both go into the cave, and then one is going to come out. Talk about being plunged into the deep end of Jungian archetypes. What a vivid powerhouse of signaling. Say more. What happened? <laughs> and I suppose now is really the first time that I thought about it, it, that being an extrapolation of the first, that first experience in the womb. That in other words, the one in the womb was just really so subtle, causal subtle, 
only retrospectively is it even subtle, right? And then it's on upon a closer look that then it really evolves into this dream that has more details exactly. that's built and adorned and decorated with all these different things that are also archetypal, bull and the horse and the forest and the cave, obviously archetypal, mythic signifiers. And then ultimately, what is that? That extrapolates then later into all the artwork and media and everything that I've <laughs> everything, yeah. everything. Yes. That it just extrapolates outward like this little electrical impulse yeah. that is, you know, 14 billion years ago, this powerhouse of electricity and energy and potentiality that then, you know, extrapolates out into the, this universe as we know it, right? Just one universe, but this one that we're enjoying. <laughs> and then I think it like that's really informs all the artwork, or everything I've done, because I think about it like Grace and Grit, which if anyone listening isn't aware of it, this brilliant book that Ken Wilber wrote that chronicles his wife Treya's journals that then he masterfully wove into a story of passionate, courageous, selfless, and ultimately transcendent love. That is a, really a story about the alchemical powers of love to mm. transform us and bring us into our own becoming. So I wrote and produced and directed and adapted that story into a movie. And it's a love story in the most simple terms, but really it's experiential. For people who are interested in the teaser, if you search Grace and Grit, movie is online. And what do I want to do with that story? What do I want to do with that outside of turn people on to Ken Wilber's mind and work? I want people to have this experience where they have to immerse themselves and go through this from passionate to courageous to selfless to transcendent love. I want people to have hope and excitement and feel the eroticism and the seduction and the desire and then the anxiety and then the devastation and then the crucifixion for the purpose of resurrection, which is what is in so many ways the purpose of art and of music and of this podcast, of this discussion, right? To yeah. open ourselves up to, it is so spectacular what's going on. And, and it's okay when we're five years old to look at a, a plumeria and go, <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. Whoa. And go bananas. So when does that not become okay? Because that's the real disgust. That's the real shame. That's the thing that perennially, why all religious traditions are so important. And this dangerous thing that's occurring in culture right now where people say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Or, you know, that they have this hard line about holding a certain thought line without allowing everything else in. I'll put a bow on that. I think that whatever religion we grow up in, whether it's Judaism or Christianity or Islam, you look at it as a kid, and if we are in one, if we grow up within one dogmatic practice, we look at another and we say, that one's ridiculous. And so many people in America, let's say, who are <laughs> Christian, Heather will look at other Hinduism, that's insane. And then you start to open your eyes and you start to say, you look at all the other ones, and you say, well, wait a second, they're all nuts. And then we say, wow, they're all beautiful. And they're all saying so much the same thing. This is really incredible. You know, when do we stop drawing on the cave walls? But what are the cave walls of today? The cave walls are today, this experience right now, this podcast, this bearing witness and celebrating that I saw something in the most simple terms outside of my living room and I have no idea what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it could have been anything. And is the possibility that there is a life force that's not so unsimilar to ours, using technology and industry in a way that's not so unsimilar to ours that we can recognize it and that it's penetrating our field of awareness, whether that's in subtle abstract realms in our dreams or in our living room or our experience, or an actual physical right there, of course it's fucking possible. Not only is it possible, it's obvious, it's definitive, it's absolute. How yeah. narcissistic and grandiose are we to think that it's just us on this gorgeous little planet and there's yeah. nothing else going on out there? I mean, that, that. <laughs> like that's so disgusting and classically human.
For me, Sebastian's sighting of this craft in the midst of L.A.'s infamous population density conjured John Lennon and Mei Peng. It was August of 74 when the momentous event occurred. Lennon and Peng were hanging in his penthouse when a seemingly random impulse came over him to go to the window. He was naked. From the window, less than 100 feet away, Lennon witnessed a silent object with flashing lights gliding through the skyscraper canyon. He estimated the speed at perhaps 30 miles an hour. He called out to Peng, also naked. She arrived at his side to behold the inexplicable. It was large, circular, shaped like a flattened cone, and coming toward them. A mesmerizing array of numerous lights were flashing on the object. She estimated its size to be that of a Learjet. Famously, the two remarked that it came so close to them if they had something to throw, they easily could have hit it. Lennon and Pang observed the object glide by the United Nations building and recede into the distance over the East River. John yelled, stop, take me with you, to no avail. Afterwards, Lennon was emphatic that he was not on any substances when the sighting occurred. He did take photos, but they were reportedly distorted and damaged when printed. Local media and police received numerous reports from others in Manhattan who had sighted the same craft. A nod to the experience features in Lennon's song, Nobody Told Me, when he sings, There's UFOs over New York, and I ain't too surprised. Lennon purportedly thought he may have been abducted early in his life, but the weirdest part of Lennon's experiences remain. According to Lennon's close friend Uri Geller, yes, that Uri Geller, in the days before he would be assassinated, Lennon gave a metal, ovoid object to Geller. Lennon said four bug-like entities had appeared in his bedroom and left the heavy egg-like keepsake in his hand. He asserted again he was not on drugs, alcohol, was not dreaming, nor hallucinating. He gave the object to Geller because it disturbed him. Weeks later, his life was taken. Aliens and Artist is brought to you by The Liminal Muse, offering one-on-one -on -one work with me, Stuart Davis, on paranormal, creative, and spiritual issues. Go to theliminalmuse.com to book a session. In the midst of perfection, this princess starts bitching. In the arms of Elijah, this something keeps twitching. This master that's teaching is a pupil repeating. This boxer loves headlines, but it couldn't take a punchline. Somebody slap me, I can't stop laughing. Suicide is back in fashion. All our sanders end up sinking, and it makes love wonder what fear's thinking. Two crows sit at the window, keeping the fear out over your widow. Two coins dropping the casket over your sockets. Bury that bastard Two thirds Ready for Easter Thinking you're Jesus Proving you Caesar Yeah Yeah Ready for Easter Right posture Right poses Too bad what's under the ropes is Still cross-eyed In the witness And searching For suchness Back home God's diamond Puts a diaper on the daughter of a mystical martyr A trigger to seizure Making believe that his body's a disease Wishing for a world where a vapor would thrive Giving up his life as if he were alive He would have his wings if feathers came from crutches Or that cushion he clutches Somebody slap me and can't stop laughing Suicide is back in fashion All our sanders end up sinking And it makes love wonder what fear's thinking Two crows sit at the window Keeping the fear job over your widow Two coins dropping the casket Over your sockets bury that bastard Two birds ready for restart Thinking you're Jesus Proving you Caesar
in the eye of a white tornado In the pit of a black volcano In the palm of a human hand There's a grain of this quicksand I'm just a girl with the planet inside of me I'm the daughter of man, but the men have been fighting me I bid my brother and my brother ignited me The pin and his twin still some devil divided me Goddess from the hominid odyssey I am Philosophy, epicac to this mythical prophecy. <laughs>